Oh, pulled away. Cracking shot. Oh, my goodness me. I haven't seen a green ball in my life. It's one on one with the bowler versus the batsman. Marshall's in again the crowd. Oh, he's made that away brilliantly. Pulling it away off his pads. And that goes for four. That was a marvellous straight by crowd. It's probably the most controversial game that, the game that the world has ever seen in terms of sport. That's a big hit. It's a small microcosm of society. You've got 11 different characters and personalities playing over a long period of time. Crow goes I just find it extremely fascinating and intriguing all round. Goes back behind me. Cricket is very much in the blood of New Zealand's Martin Crow. Nearly 5,500 test match runs at an average of just over 45, a figure which separates the great batsman from the merely good. Injury forced a premature end to an outstanding playing career. At just 37, Crow still has plenty to offer the game, especially in his role as a cricket ambassador. Brought up in a cricket-mad family in Auckland, his father, David, was a first-class player, while elder brother Jeff also went on to captain his country. As a schoolboy, Martin Crow stood out among his peers. He was only 15 when selected to play for Auckland. In those formative years, he spent hours in the backyard imitating his heroes. Early idols included West Indian Sir Gary Sobers, the world's greatest all-rounder. But as he reached his late teens, Australian Greg Chappell became his role model. It was his supreme technique as well as his toughness of character that Crow admired so much. Many agree the elegant right-handed stroke maker from New Zealand succeeded in emulating his idol. Martin Crow wasn't short on bravery either. Oh, he's been hit, Martin Crow. And he's in a bit of trouble. Against Australia in Christchurch in 1986, he was hit in the face by a bouncer from Bruce Reed. Despite having 10 stitches in the wound, he returned later to complete a magnificent 137. So things haven't always gone smoothly for Crow, particularly when he was launched into the test arena as a 19-year-old. I was selected the same day I scored my first 100 in first-class cricket, and I don't think that um, really is the right recipe. I think you should have uh, scored maybe five or six hundreds at least, so that you've proven to yourself that you have the confidence to score at one level, let alone try and, and do it at the top level. I mean, I, I started off by not reaching double figures for my first six innings. Um, up against Lily and Thompson and Willis and both of them, and I was completely out of my depth. His ability, though, was never in doubt, and after that faltering start, Crow began to shine. With his batting and the bowling of a certain Sir Richard Hadley, New Zealand were now a match for anyone. In 1985, the Kiwis toured Australia with high hopes of securing a first-ever series win. In the first test, Crow rose to the challenge. Beautiful straight drive. Century. Crow went on to 188, and with Hadley taking 15 wickets in the match, including nine in Australia's first innings, the tone had been set for a 2-1 series victory. We were chuffed, and we knew that we had them where we wanted them, that we could do something special if we maintained our form. Uh, and we were a pretty professional unit by that stage in the mid-80s. A first series win in England followed, and in 1987, Crow decided to return to English county cricket with Somerset. He walked right into the middle of a crisis. Crow was offered a contract, which meant the end at Somerset for Viv Richards and Joel Garner. The county was split. Caught up in the turmoil, Crow was even subjected to death threats from disgruntled supporters. Matters weren't to improve for Crow when he and the New Zealand squad arrived for a tour of Sri Lanka in April of that year. They found themselves caught up in a civil war, and it wasn't long before the tour was abandoned. Martin Crowe has far happier memories of facing Sri Lanka. Appointed captain for the first time in 1991, he and Andrew Jones needed to bat for two and a half days to save the first test. Andrew Jones and I just sort of knew what we had to do, and we just did it over by over by over, and all of a sudden 100 clocked by, and then 200, then 300. And there it is, a partnership of 300 runs. 
between Martin Crow and Andrew Jones. Just the second time in New Zealand Test cricket that that's happened. And then we were sitting uh, in the dressing room at tea break on the last day, and uh, Ian Smith said, uh, you've got one more run to get. I said, what are you talking about? You've got one more run for the world record. And I spent four nervous deliveries uh, before I tucked one off my hip for a single to give us uh, the world record, which was an amazing feeling, really. These two players have now scored more runs together than any other two in Test history. The final record, 467, and Crow himself was nearing a New Zealand landmark. So I had thought about possibly um, overtaking Glenn Turner's 259 as the highest individual innings for New Zealand and uh, when I was on 258 and got a three I was pretty chuffed to, to hold the record. That's a bit wide and Crow gets the record here and has now scored more runs in an individual innings than any New Zealand test batsman. He finished on 299, still New Zealand's highest individual test score. Now he faced another challenge, preparing his side for the 1992 World Cup. We started 18 months out planning our preparation for the World Cup, knowing it was in Australia and New Zealand. It was a big moment for the team and uh, we worked on a number of initiatives. One uh, and, and foremost was our fielding. New Zealand took on co-hosts Australia in the opening match and a crow century inspired his team. He chopped it down, they're running through. Kansas made it. And we'd played Australia a lot over the last couple of years. We were losing regularly, playing the normal pattern. Um, so we decided to go out with Dipak Patel and open the bowling. And uh, we got 240 for our innings. Dipak came on and I think it shocked them a little. And from there um, we fielded like demons, we were absolutely brilliant in the field, particularly Chris Keynes and Chris Harris. They're taking him on, they're going to have to hurry. Jones always hurries, he's going to be out. He's taken him on once too often. We pulled off a shock, and, and that gave us the confidence to then move into the next phase, which was trying to qualify for the semis. Opening the bowling with Deepak Patel's offspin proved to be inspired. Mark Greatbatch's pinch hitting was also crucial as New Zealand's innovative tactics took them into that semi-final. Crow's own form was tremendous. He was the tournament's leading run scorer with 456 at an average of 114. It was becoming a fairy tale for fans and players alike. In the semi-final against Pakistan, Crow was in majestic form again. But on his way to 91, he suffered a devastating hamstring injury. Well, I pulled it in uh, my innings, and um, what happened was that I wasn't able to take. Well, I pulled it in uh, my innings, and um, what happened was that I wasn't able to take the field. And the physio said, "You're better off, uh, you know, not aggravating it any further in case you can't." play in the final and I said to him well if I don't get out there we may not be in the final simply because our tactics were so different that no one could come in as John Wright did and just pick up the blueprint because it, it was really I was the only person that kind of knew how it works. That's it. And there it is now is that going away for That's four? It. I think it is and it's Jones run down it's into the boundary bar for four and it is the end of the match Pakistan have won the semi-final and Despite defeat, Crows New Zealand had secured its place in cricket folklore. Injuries, a factor throughout his career, would continue to dog his footsteps. In 1993, he had major knee surgery from which he never really recovered. At the age of 33, Crows playing days...